afternoon, everyone. Uh, let's get started. We have made it to the final week before the spring break. Kudos to us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I definitely need a break. I don't know about you. Um, I want to uh, first highlight that the midterm course feedback is open, and I would really, really appreciate if you all submit your feedback. Um, the course feedback is is useful to me to know the things you would like to see improved in this course. And especially in the in the you know in the middle of this course, we can still make some changes, uh, especially in terms of lectures and things I can uh, easily modify. So if there are things you would like to see you know changed in the um, second part of the semester, please feel free to say so. This is anonymous, like you won't get penalized by uh, anyway, uh, if you freely share what you uh, what you uh, want uh, in this um, in this uh, course, uh, just a moment. I have someone who had joined, and I don't know how is that even possible because I just made this um, made this Zoom. So let me just check what's happening. We don't want to have some intruders. Okay, so far it's only me. Okay, good. Hopefully they don't return. Um, okay, and so uh, the midterm course feedback is not important for my own evaluation, uh, but just a heads up for the final uh, final course feedback. This feedback is also used when uh, you know my colleagues look at my whole um, um, kind of progress and they evaluate whether I'm a good teacher, and based on that they evaluate whether I get to keep this job or eventually maybe not. So uh, later on when we have final course feedback, I will just remind you uh, of that uh, as well. So the final course feedback, it's not only I who see it, uh, the other professors see it too, but for mid course feedback, uh, it's just, the, it's only me who sees the feedback. Um, to kind of encourage you to do this, if you 80% of more of you submit this feedback, I'll grant everyone uh, a small, small uh, uh, points to the final grade. Uh, of course, if you just say, you know, sentence like blah, 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 I will count, will not count those as a part of these 80%. Okay, so hopefully, hopefully you submit that. Uh, usually I, for the final feedback, I uh, use the uh, the actual class time to do so. Uh, but for the midterm course feedback, um, I will hope that you will do this after the uh, class and uh, we'll move forward. And the topic of today, as you all know, is uh, just going through the topics we have talked about as a way to prepare, somewhat prepare for our midterm uh, exam. That's uh, this Wednesday at the usual class time uh, and usual place. Um, uh, just a heads up that, uh, as I said last time, this is not mean to be like to say every exact topic that might occur in you know every single term that's mentioned here is uh, the only relevant term for the exam. This is just meant to be like um, one you know kind of like let's go over the course topic altogether. But please look at the slides and the lectures uh, of, of everything we have covered because everything can appear in the exam. Questions will be multiple choice questions, so very easy format. And the questions will be about the knowledge, like knowledge focus. Um, um, there won't be any like need to do any kind of math computations or programming or anything like that. Uh, but the questions might require you to do like one or two steps of reasoning. So it won't be like, what is self-attention? And then, you know, you'd say what self-attention is. Um, so it should be fairly straightforward if you have, especially if you have attended lectures, I don't see any, any issue with uh, this exam. Uh, this is mostly for me sanity check that, uh, you know, indeed you know the basics of this course, uh, especially since I do not have a full control of what's happening when you are doing your homeworks. I hope you all are, you know, doing them yourself and submitting your solutions. Uh, but this is for me, like I can then compare uh, the discourse in the homeworks with the scores of the exams and uh, the huge discrepancy is uh, concerning. Um, maybe the only tricky part of this exam, which is not really tricky, is that you get negative points for selecting wrong choices. Uh, so you do need to be a little bit extra of what are you selecting. And there are not maybe one or more uh, 
correct answer choices, and I will not tell you which how many uh, there are. So that's the only, I would say, slight complication in this uh, uh, straightforward exam. And please uh, bring your ID uh, with you on Wednesday because we will check your ID when you submit your exam. Okay, any uh, questions about the logistics of the exam? Yes, please. It's gonna be on paper. Okay, if you remember something, please ask throughout this lecture. This is great time and place to ask any questions you have about midterm. So yeah, let's go kind of make a little, you know, go retrospectively over what we have talked about in this course. We started with what is NLP? And I told you NLP is also sometimes referred to as computational linguistics, or sometimes people say, well, it is just applied machine learning or deep learning. And maybe to this at this point, you kind of can sense why people would say uh, something like that. We said there are two fundamental questions of NLP. The first one, in what ways can computers understand and use natural language, which has been addressed by building computer programs that show language understanding and language use behavior. It is an engineering pursuit that heavily depends on advances in hardware. And we have seen that NLP approaches today are end-to-end -end deep learning uh, models. Uh, and we learned that the deep learning is a field of algorithms around neural networks that's subpart of machine learning. And this is basically what we have focused on in this first part of the course. Uh, we talked about how to build models that can do certain uh, applications. And those applications, do, to some extent, if the model can do them, then the model exhibits some level of a language understanding. For example, we have talked about how to build a machine translation system. And then when the machine translation system is good, according to our measurements, uh, that model does have some uh, language use behavior, some, uh, some uh, language understanding. Um, I said that the, uh, the people in NLP also care about another question, which we didn't really talk about much, and that's to what extent can the properties of natural language uh, be simulated computationally? And here we approach understanding human language, our language that we all use to communicate, which is still very much so an open scientific mystery. We can use these computational approaches to see how um, to, to, to find a little bit more about human language, uh, which is still, uh, as I said, we don't exactly understand. Uh, we don't have this, you know, clear theory of uh, natural uh, language. Uh, and we didn't talk much about this. Um, if you if you go and check the Gradient uh, podcast, there is a great episode recently with a professor from MIT that works on these kinds of things. And you can learn a little bit more how, you know, large language models are now maybe um, new tools to drive this kind of research because these large language models, as we have learned, learn these very rich representations of text, they might be used to uh, kind of uh, make a progress on, on, on this question as well. Something we didn't really talk about much um, uh, yet. Okay, and we like when we started, we also talked about this history of NLP. And just to kind of give you a context of what we have uh, talked about, um, now that you know more, is we basically focus on this very, very end, right? Like at the uh, at uh, a computational approaches to uh, NLP that are built on neural networks. And our first kind of example of what we wanted to do was a sentiment classification, which is now we know a task for doing a higher level application of sentiment analysis. And in this task, we are focusing on a specific domain of movie reviews, not any movie reviews, but those that are written on IMDb, which are typically longer uh, than any other review, like a tweet, for example. And uh, we have focused on classification in two, only two classes, positive or negative, which is simplification, right? We have multiple labels we could assign or even something descriptive um, about sentiment. 
But our first question was how to approach building a sentiment classifier with machine learning tools. And we have then learned that you can't just give a string to the model, to whatever a model is, hoping that some computations will happen, right? Uh, computers work with numbers. So we need to represent these strings, which represent our movie reviews with uh, vectors that have numerical values. So this was uh, this is something I kind of vaguely referred to featureization or producing a feature vector out of a string uh, input string. And once we have this representation, then we have learned that okay, now we want to do uh, supervised machine learning. Machine supervised machine learning is a is a subclass of machine learning where we learn from the labeled data. So we have inputs, but we also have human labeled outputs. We have also later seen examples of self-supervised machine learning, where again we have um, we pretend we have supervised machine learning, uh, but instead of human labeling the data, the data came just you know it just came as it is. Namely, we had a corpus of text and we did language modeling. We were still doing supervised machine learning at the end, right? Like we had pretended that whatever word comes next is the gold truth label. So that is supervised machine learning. But that gold truth label didn't come from a human actually labeling that uh, next word. And therefore, this is an example of self-supervised machine learning. And we basically did not talk about unsupervised machine learning, which doesn't do either of these. So going back to supervised machine learning, we have said, okay, now we have this representation of the input. We are trying to find a function that goes from that input to the output, which tells us what is the label of this given new example. And of course, if we had that exact function that wouldn't exist, machine learning wouldn't exist, right? Like we would be done. Uh, but we don't know what the exact function is. We just make some assumption about its form. And the first form of function that we have assumed is that the function is linear. So we can write a linear, uh, just a line equation for a line, right? We still don't know what the parameters uh, of that line are. What is the slope, right? Where does it start? Where is the origin? So we had to learn those things. And that's what the point of machine learning is, to find those parameters, to learn that function. And we are learning that through our labeled data. We are learning that iteratively, as we have seen a couple of times, especially in our homeworks, right? Where you make a best guess, you have certain loss, and then you go change your parameters and try again, change the parameters until you reach the level of accuracy that you find satisfying on your training data. So learning, optimization, loss function, these are the important terms we have uh, constantly mentioned in this course. And then we said, okay, now that we have find the appropriate function, uh, we are going to evaluate it on the held out test data, right? We need to demonstrate to everyone that you, this model we have built on the training data actually work for new unseen instances uh, later on. And uh, this is called, as we said, generalization. We want our model to be able to generalize to new unseen instances. And I think you all in your homeworks have struggled with that as well, right? It's easy to kind of overfit on your data, achieve 100% accuracy, but then you see that dip on the development or the test set. and Usually you would tweak your hyperparameters to avoid that situation. Okay, so that's kind of like the high level, um, you know, overview of what are what have we been doing. We were doing this featureization, and then we were finding the ways to learn functions m. And now we are going to go over uh, how exactly we have done that. Before we could even produce uh, vectors, we had to do some pre-processing. And the first pre-processing we can do is uh, text normalization. Uh, we can, um, you know, we didn't really play around with this, especially in our homeworks, but we can lowercase the text. Maybe you have done that. Maybe you removed stop words because you deemed them unimportant, or you uh, stripped all the suffixes from the words, which we've called stemming. Maybe you uh, uh, normalize each one of the words to their lemma, which is that canonical form of the word. We can do all of these uh, things with pre-trained language models later on. Uh, we stop caring about those things, right? Remember when I was demoing you how to use hugging face and when we have wrote a pre-processing function, 
that pre-processing function only did tokenization, right? Or maybe sometimes lowercase, but nothing else. Which brings us to tokenization. Um, again, we want to go from a string to a vector. And the first thing we want to do is we want to split that string into tokens or smaller units. Um, what are those units exactly? We have used this definition from 1992 that says that these are basic units which need not to be decom decomposed in a subsequent processing. And the easiest token then to think about, according to this definition, is a character, right? Like character, you can't, I mean, you can if you go into something obnoxious, but like you don't want to, um, you know, uh, dissect it further than that. Um, however, we have seen that characters, if we would have pure character driven models, then these models will have to learn a lot about words themselves, that certain characters form words in certain ways, uh, the notion about prefixes, suffixes, and uh, all of that word boundaries, all of that would need to learn from scratch, and that's too much learning to do. For some languages, that's appropriate. We have seen uh, in certain cases, but for uh, English and a lot of Western languages, it's not it's not the ideal case. Uh, another extreme is to just use words, and we have seen so many issues with splitting by words, starting with punctuation that now becomes part of a previous word. Not great. We didn't like that. Um, we were kind of com contemplating a, um, about the idea of linguistically motivated units. Um, but then um, we also said that there isn't uniform unified theory of what that would look like. So eventually we'll end on subwords, somewhere in between characters and full words, uh, which are learned through in a data-driven approach, right? Like we don't make assumptions about what these subwords are, rather we take the gigantic corpus of language you care about, let's say English, and then we have an algorithm that's going to learn what the subwords are for us. And that you know brought us to this idea of pre-tokenization. So pre-tokenization is a step we do before tokenization, where we split words in, um, for example, words. And then after we do that, we do the actual tokenization, which is splitting into subwords. Um, Pre-tokenization, we have played around a little bit as well in hugging face. We have seen that it's a legit term. If you go to hugging face, you have pre-tokenizers, and that's going to refer to usually. Um, splitting by words, and then we have um, tokenizers, which are usually something like BPP, BPE, which we um, have learned is one of the most common tokenizers right now. Um, BPE uh, is going to, for us, first learn vocabulary, which is a set of tokens, right? And right now we are moving to idea that this is uh, vocabulary is going to be a set of uh, subwords. But we don't know what the subwords are, and this is what BPE is going to give us. So we, uh, when we use BPE, it first pre-tokenizes the, co to the corpus we give it in words. And the fact that we are giving it to the corpus means that uh, whatever we end up learning is dependent on the corpus we are given, right? So that's something you need to be mindful of. If you have a very specialized application in um, very specialized this domain. Let's say all you care about are patents. You, you have a corpus of patents. That's very different from just a natural language that might appear on the web. So you might decide, well, I need a more specialized uh, tokenizer as well. And instead of using any you know tokenizer that has already been trained, I'm going to uh, apply BP on my corpus of patents. And then your BP tokenizer is going to look like uh, it's going to be different than if I had trained BP on, let's say, corpus of tweets or corpus of news articles. Okay, so we want to do pre-tokenization because later on we want to respect the word boundaries. We don't want to produce subverts that cross word boundaries. That's not something we want, and that's why we do this pre-tokenization step. And um, just an implementation detail of how we achieve that is that we add this uh, underscore to the end of each word. Um, we initialize our vocabulary with a set of all individual characters that appear in our corpus. Usually, um, if we have a large corpus, it's going to be all the letters in alphabet plus some other 
you know, maybe exclamation point and things like that, some punctuation signs. And then uh, we are going to iteratively do the following. We are choosing two tokens that are most frequently adjacent and we respect the word boundaries, as I said, and then um, we add a new merge symbol to, uh, to the vocabulary. Um, and then we change the occurrence of the two selective tokens with a new merge token uh, in the corpus. So if we had a, um, and maybe something I should mention here as, a, as a, another step, is once you make this vocabulary with the initial set of individual characters, you basically split all your uh, entire corpus by those uh, characters. So you end up with the sequence of characters uh, as a representation of your entire corpus. And then you end up, you here in this step, you start merging those that appear uh, frequently uh, together into a single string. And then you do this until you do K merges. Remember I told you K is a hyperparameter, you choose K and end up, you will end up with a vocabulary of size K plus initial set of characters. So uh, the size of vocabulary is gonna be determined by the number of merges you are uh, deciding uh, we are going to have. And you remember, we later talked about language modeling and we know that the output matrix is gonna be size of the hidden dimension time, the numbers of words in the, uh, in the vocab, excuse me, number of tokens in the vocabulary. So we wanna be mindful of that, right? Like we have seen variations. We've seen 30,000 tokens and 100, thousand tokens, the, the hundred thousand tokens is way more. And therefore that output matrix is going to be uh, just way huger. And the question is whether you want to sacrifice that number of parameters to just go to this output matrix or you rather have it for the intermediate computations that you know make the nonlinear transformations of your input representations that are important for learning really complex tasks. Um, and what's K? Uh, as I mentioned, there are two, two values at least we have seen, but it's still very much so open research question of what ideal K is or uh, K being the vocabulary size eventually. Okay, so once we have our our uh, our set of you know learned vocabulary, uh, then um, then we basically do the uh, splitting of a given sentence in a very similar fashion. We find like. Uh, we we are looking for the uh, these symbols that emerge and and and, and do the actions uh, we have been doing uh, uh, later. Um, and I kind of brought this uh, um, example before this illustration uh, to kind of show you how complex research on tokenization is. Currently, we use BPE, but it's definitely not the only way to do tokenization. And uh, it is an active area of research of uh, how to tokenize text properly. Um, because we, we've seen, I, I'm not bringing these examples again, but at the end of the lecture on tokenization, I show you a bunch of failures of these BPE tokenizers that then uh, influence the model uh, later on. Remember the example, super bizarre, which uh, split the word into superb, and therefore the sentiment classifier thought it's gonna be a positive review when it was uh, super, super bizarre is actually very negative, right? Um, so yeah, that, that was just a briefly about how we uh, covered tokenization. And uh, now we have our string, input string, we had tokenized it. Now we have a list of strings where each one of these strings in the list is a subword, right? So we are still not at the point where we have a vector with numerical values, and that's what we are going to do next. And you can think about this as input featureization. Um, features for me, and I want you to think about it as well, are features are whatever ends up in the vocabulary, right? Um, so your vocabulary and its size determines the number of features. Um, um, alternative way of thinking is to think the values in the feature vectors are features, which is not wrong. If you said that to me, I wouldn't be like, I don't know what you're talking about. And as I said, this, like what exactly feature is, is, um, yeah, it is, uh, it is not a very well-defined term, but in this course for us, features are gonna be whatever ends up in our vocabulary. Okay, so the first uh, first way of producing a vector that represents this now list of uh, strings was to uh, do the so-called bag of engrams representations. And um, here we have split the sentence by words. 
We have used word tokenizer, um, and we have uh, focused on two grams, which are two sequences of two uh, two uh, tokens. Uh, so for us, because we did uh, word splitting, that means that two grams, or as we call them more precisely, bigrams, are um, sequences of two words. So here, this is is one bigram is an an interesting interesting movie and movie period. Um, and then uh, our feature vector was uh, a vector of the size of the vocabulary. And um, we have put zero or one depending of whether the word in a vocabulary is uh, occurring. So here, now I see, uh, I, I just took uh, whatever I was writing in the uh, iPad. So this is a little bit confusing because the uh, example in black color is showing you bag of unigrams, so just a single word. Uh, but then I suppose later on, I, I wanted to show you what bigrams are. So I did this uh, green uh, representation. So if you are now extra confused, let me clarify. Um, what I'm actually showing you is a bag of unigrams uh, example where we our vocabulary is going to be um, a dictionary of just single words because we are working with unigrams, which we don't really call one grams, but that would be the same thing. Uh, and then feature vector is of the size of the vocabulary as always. And we write either one or zero presence or absence of the word in this example, um, a given word in a vocabulary, whether it's present or absent in this example. And we have also said that we could also count uh, how many times this word occurs. So that, that there are two options. If we had bigrams, our vocabulary would look different. And this is important, right? We would have uh, our vocabulary would consist of this is is an, an interesting, interesting movie. And because there is uh, less bigrams than unigrams, we would have a smaller size of the vocabulary. Um, OK, so that was the simplest uh, way of representing our features. We have talked a little bit about TFIDF, which is a very similar idea. But you kind of want to make your documents where the you know that you are representing um, a different as you know you want to find representations that make these examples um, differ if they have certain words that are occurring in one of these documents way more than in any other of the documents that words then become special for that uh, one document and that was. Uh, measured by this inverse document frequency. Basically, if uh, if uh, one uh, token had appeared in uh, just a single document, then we would divide uh, here only by one. But it, if it had appeared with, you know, D documents, D being some large number, then we would divide here by a very large number. And therefore, the importance of that token for that document would lower. So if the token is kind of, a, this, we would say, discriminative feature for that document, it becomes more important under TF-IDF. However, we weren't super happy with neither of these um, representations uh, because we we recovered many aspects of meaning that we care about, and we called the uh, this uh, field of linguistics that care about meaning of single words. Uh, we called it lexical semantics, and we talked about word senses how one word can have multiple meanings. I gave you an example of Bayesian throughout this course. We have talked about that some words have the same senses. There are synonyms or in, um, you know, a completely opposite would be if they have opposite uh, senses such as hot and cold, and those were antonyms. We also wanted some notion of word similarity, like they're not exact synonyms, but but they they, they are similar words. And maybe they, they are kind of related like a doctor and uh, I don't know, MRI machine. Like they are not, they don't have same meanings at all, right? But they do have some level of relatedness and that's important for NLP applications. So that brought us to vector semantics, which is built on extremely important concept of distributional hypothesis that comes from linguistics, that words that occur in similar contexts tend to have similar meanings. And uh, what folks in 2014 or a little bit earlier had uh, decided is to embrace this uh, distributional hypothesis and to build vector representations based on it. So 
Vector semantics instantiates this idea of distributional hypothesis by learning vector representations uh, of the meaning of words directly from their distributions of text. Um, and this gives us uh, this idea of embeddings, uh, these resulting vector representation, we call them embeddings. Um, they are, when people tell you embedding, what should come to your mind is short, dense representation, right? If I tell you feature vector, you could be like, it could be anything, but if I tell you embedding, you're, you're immediately should think short, dense, right? Short because uh, as you've seen in your homeworks, you work with the uh, vectors of size 50 or 300. Uh, just a few slides ago, I told you about, we could have 100,000 tokens in the vocabulary as we did with the Berta version three, right? Which means that you, if you do the presence absence kind of uh, feature vector, you would have a 100,000 dimensional vector, way larger than just 50. And that would be a long vector and these ones are short. And the other one also had lots of zeros, right? Like if you have 100,000 words and you're, you have like a single sentence you want to represent, yeah, for sure, most of the vector is going to be uh, just zero. And we call those kinds of representations sparse and embeddings are dense because they don't have zeros uh, in their vectors. Okay, but how did we learn these embeddings exactly? How did we embrace this idea of distributional uh, hypothesis, which is reminder words that occur in similar contexts tend to have similar meanings? Well, what people have done is they, um, instead of counting how often each token occurs near other token, like a uh, parrot, they trained a classifier on a binary prediction task, which uh, tries to do uh, answer the following is the word W likely to show up near parrot. Um, specifically, we had a uh, skipgram uh, algorithm that uh, modeled this uh, probability that the word W and another word C that appears in the context of the W uh, is going to appear together. Um, so their probability equaling to one with the logistic function that we really like, right? Um, and that logistic function, remember, whenever it is very high, the values, it's going to have probability one. So the way we were thinking about this, okay, we, we also like dot products. Dot products tell us that two vectors are similar. So if we would have a vector of word W and a vector of word that appears in its context C, uh, and their dot products should be high because they do indeed appear together in the context of our corpus. Uh, in the context in our corpus. So here, uh, logistic, uh, logistic function is going to be uh, one when these values are high. So um, we take the, the form of logistic function. This is just a formula. Instead of Z, we place our dot products between W and C. Uh, and in this way, if the, if the dot product between these two vectors is high, the probability of them appearing together under this model is gonna be high too. The only issue here, that's great, that's a setup. We didn't really learn what C and W are, right? And that's the goal. It's The goal is to learn these representations. And then later on, when we learn them, we just use them. We don't care about the classifier. We will never use this classifier for anything meaningful, right? Um, we just care about the resulting vectors. And to do that, we had a set of positive and negative examples. Uh, basically, you again, take a corpus of English text, and then for each word, you look at the uh, context. And you determine what the context is. Very often in the, in the lecture, we would say the context is, is two words that appear before and two words that appear after the given word. So that, though, all of such windows become your positive examples. But you actually need lots of negative examples of when certain words do not appear in the context of a given word. And um, we, we, in some way, uh, build those negative examples, those negative windows. And then we just want to maximize the similarity of a target word uh, and a given context word that had actually appeared together in the context. And we want to minimize the similarity of the word and another word that did not appear in its context uh, from the uh, uh, as you know, together with this maximization. So there is this max max min kind of optimization, which you see a lot in, in machine learning. 
Um, and yeah, we do this, we train the model. Eventually we end up with these um, vectors, as I said, and then we just use those vectors. We save them in a metrics or whatever data structure we like. And then we later on use them as you did in your homeworks, right? Like later on you use just the representations and build new layers at top of those representations to build a sentiment classifier. Um, I've already mentioned the difference between short and long vectors, also dense and sparse. Um, another another uh, important uh, uh, classification is between non-interpretable dimensions of a vector and interpretable. So with word to vec vectors that we have just covered, when we get these dense vectors, we don't in the end understand what is each one of the dimensions of this vector representing, right? Uh, we don't know when, you know, we have this 50 dimensional vector space, but we do not know what each dimension in this space means. Unlike with the absence presence kind of feature vectors where in new, each dimension corresponds to whether the corresponding token in the vocabulary appeared or not in the um, in a given document we are representing. So virtual ve vectors, these embeddings have non-interpretable dimensions and um, other feature vectors we have seen before, they have interpretable dimensions. We have also talked about the difference between static and contextualized vectors. Uh, statics are, this, all of the vectors I have just mentioned are static vectors because regardless of the context in which the word appears, you're always going to represent it with the same vector. Remember we said, but we do have different senses of this word. Like I showed you a bunch of example with Bayesian. Regardless of the context, we would still represent it with the same vector, which was the limitation. And then, oh, great, I have that example here. So here we had Amazon Basin, she filled the basin with the water and cranial basin in, in your skull. Uh, regardless of, in each one of these cases, we would represent basin, basin with the same word to vec vector. Uh, and that's not great, right? Because then we are not modeling the exact sense of this word. And then what we have talked about are these uh, contextualized representation through self-attention. Self-attention was our mechanism to make representation of each one of the tokens more mixed with the representation of other tokens. And we achieved that by first, we have learned uh, through this softmax query times uh, key uh, transpose matrix, importance of each token to the other token, right? Um, and then when we multiply that matrix with the value matrix, in value matrix, each one of these rows was a current representation of a given token. Here we just have two, the input was of sequence two, so we had only two tokens. And when you do that multiplication, basically what you're doing is you are mixing the uh, representation of the per first token with the representation of the second token. According to how much the second token is important to the first token, which we get in this matrix. So self-intention makes these uh, representations of each tokens more and more contextualized with respect to the tokens of other, uh, excuse me, with, with respect to the uh, uh, other input uh, tokens. So in the end, when we, uh, you know, here we have representation like illustration of BERT, uh, when we shove uh, our input tokens to BERT, in the end, what we get uh, from the final uh, encoder block is very contextualized representation of each one of these tokens. And um, then you can either average them all out or with BERT specifically, we have always appended this CLS token and then we have used it as our very, very contextualized representation of the entire uh, input and the, the classification um, uh, atop of it, which I'll come back to. I just wanted to bring this um, Rep representation over here to show yet another way, I guess, uh, of producing feature vector. Because here, this when we get to the you know final layer of uh, of uh, BERT uh, and get the final representation of our input, that's now our very very non-linear contextualized representation of the input. Okay. So we covered pre-processing, we have covered uh, featureization, and we'll now go into the modeling. 
But let's maybe stop for a second here and see whether there are any questions. I'm going to write this here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Just a moment. Okay, so skip Chrome and uh, self attention are learned in a very different ways, right? So with skip Chrome, we just build a neural network which will do this task. Uh, over here is word w likely to show up near parrot. Um, so that's our our task, and we have a small neural network that just does this task. And uh, what's important with this neural network is the way we optimize it. We do this max min or min max optimization where we want to minimize the um, similarity with example with between word pairs that don't occur together in our corpus and maximize the similarity between the words that actually appear together in the corpus. So that's skip gram. So yeah. Uh, it's got, it's a hyperparameter reset, right? Uh, but as you have seen in your homeworks, uh, the ones we have available are either in 50 or 300 dimensional uh, vectors. It is something you choose, but you want something smaller and, you know, 300 have, I think is typically what we, uh, you would, you would choose. Yeah. Now, self-attention is completely orthogonal to Skibran, right? Uh, it is, um, you know, um, it kind of first came together with the transformer. That's important. It wasn't, no one produced self-attention saying, I'm going to learn a better skip gram. That, that wasn't like the historical sequence that we have seen, right? Rather, we have started with, okay, there is this new architecture. And uh, from machine translation and sequence to sequence modeling with RNN, we have learned that the attention, attending to other tokens is really important, right? And then this idea was brought to the uh, build, you know, design of the transformer where this self-attention layer was introduced, but slightly different from that uh, sequence to sequence uh, attention we have seen in that, that we also care about um, the, um, you know, pairwise importances of tokens that are given in the input. Whereas previously we just cared from the coding step to the uh, encoder. And later on in Transformer, we also have that from encoder to uh, encoder that was called cross attention, right? But in Transformer, we also care about this um, building this, whatever the given input is, we want to build these highly contextualized uh, representations of tokens uh, depending on their relationship between uh, each other. So this is how self-attention self came, came about, right? Uh, and now, you know, uh, later on, we have talked about pre-training and uh, during, you know, a lot of, lot of, lot of training with lots of data and certain self-supervised uh, objectives, uh, you end up learning representation later on that are very, very helpful. And we call this transfer learning. These features that are now captured in this representation are relevant for many other tasks, not just language modeling or mask language modeling. So yeah, to maybe you're, it's hard to like super directly answer your question. So first of all, skip from and self-attention completely different, you know, orthogonal things. Um, that said, uh, where to vec representations that we got from Skipgram were used as an input to our models. And now we have moved on to transformer and we have pre-trained transformer. So what we get in the embedding matrix in the first layer is very alike where to vec in a sense that these are static representations. You always are gonna start with the same embedding for Bayesian, but then you do all these computations and self-attention especially gives you more contextualized representation. So when you come to the end of your, you know, sequences of transformation, you will get a representation that's way richer. And then you can do basically what you did before with word to vec have a classification layer at top of it. But you kind of train everything together, which is also new. Well, you know, you can yeah, so only in the first layer, yeah. 
uh, in only in the first layer, you are starting with the static representation. But now, remember we had that residual connection. So we want to add the vectors from our first embedding layer of transformer later on and later on. We constantly keep adding them. So dimension you have in the, your first embedding layer, dimension of those vectors determine how big of your representation is going to be in the end. So now we don't want to use word to vec vectors because then we are stuck with whatever dimensions uh, they have uh, you know, produced. With that would be 50 of 300. And then you can say to me, well, okay, let's maybe pre-train work to work embeddings of a larger size and then put them as a first, you know, uh, layer of a transformer and then only pre-train it. I don't know that anyone had done that. And I don't know what exactly would be the benefit of that, maybe to learn um, faster, but then, and then you need to kind of count in the cost of the uh, work to work for training. So uh, yeah, you start randomly from scratch, and then by pre-training the transformer, you're going to learn static representations that are reasonable uh, for the later on uh, computations. Okay, so um, any other questions about featureization? Yes, please. Um, when you were talking about like short-term knowledge, mm -hmm. unpredictable and like unpredictable, mm -hmm. so anything like short non-interpretable and Not really. So first of all, uh, you should be thinking about this categorization regardless of the exact, you know, um, vectors we have mentioned. So uh, any vector can be short or long, or any vector can be dense or sparse, and so on. Um, and then I was giving you examples of vectors that we have mentioned that fall under these categories. Uh, and then word to vec was short because it comes into, you know, it's either 50 or 300 dimensional, uh, those absence or presence uh, vectors that are of the size of the number of tokens in the vocabulary. Those are long because we have many tokens in the vocabulary. Um, uh, embeddings or word to vec vectors or blob vectors, whatever we have mentioned, those were dense. They didn't have zeros, unlike absence or presence vectors that have lots of zeros. Um, static embeddings were all of these that we have mentioned before. We have mentioned self-attention and transformers. Uh, only with self-attention we have started to produce representations that are highly contextualized. And then um, both word to vec and these uh, representations that come out of transformers are not interpretable in a sense that their dimensions are not interpretable, uh, but uh, the vectors with absence or presence or counts, whatever. whenever I could describe what the dimension actually is, those have interpretable dimensions. So yeah. I don't think you quite uh, put uh, you know the the exact instance you know exact examples uh, right to uh, these uh, cat categories. So hopefully that is now a little bit clearer. Yes, please. Is there like a theoretical reasoning for why the, the size of the density is like fifty to three hundred? That just a theoretical. Yeah. So, you know, before transformer were scaled to the sizes they were scaled, uh, uh, people were commonly say that if you have shorter vectors, then the subsequent matrices, their dimensions are also smaller and you have overall smaller number of parameters. So the chance to overfit on your training data or in other words, to have poor generalization is less likely. That was a common argument, which does make sense. But now with um, very, very large scale transformers, we again have uh, lots of, you know, um, lots of, uh, you know, the sizes of these vectors become uh, large. Again, not as large as hundred, uh, you know, thousand. That's still like way more than any of the, you know, dimensions we have with transformers, which might be a few thousand, but not nothing as, as crazy as, you know, even more than a dozen or thousand uh, 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 dimensions. So, yeah, I think that's one argument. Um, but um, yeah, it's a little bit hard now that everything is so scaled to also kind of fully, fully embrace it. I, I would say, yeah. Um, so that was about short versus long 
uh, why why shorter would be would be better. And then with uh, uh, dense or sparse, with learning with lots of zeros is just hard. Yeah, it's a, it's computationally uh, it's computationally hard to learn very sparse models. And remember how much redundancy we had with transformers, all those you know multi-headed attention, and then few encoder blocks repeating those transformations. Um, at some point, I mentioned that people have shown that you can prune a lot of these attention heads and still have the same performance. So for some reason, learning this redundancy is useful. And then later on, you can prune it out of the model and have a sparser version of the model, which might be you know, easier to store on hardware, which we would appreciate given that the GPU memory is always an issue uh, for training. Yeah, and then there is a whole line of theoretical work on infinitely wide neural networks. Um, you know, you can think about if you have infinite number of columns or very, very wide matrices, these kinds of models have very neat theoretical properties that would be amazing. But uh, in practice, we haven't been able to actually train infinitely wide approximation of infinitely wide neural network that has the same, uh, you know, level of performance. Um, as your, you know, good old transformer from 2017. Um, so there are definitely some theoretical works about how these, you know, dimensions, what kind of properties they could give us. But then there is also, you know, a little bit of um, gap between the theory and practice because with theory, very often we make assumptions and then uh, result in this gap. Yeah. Yes. Am I understanding correctly that self attention? Embedding and futurization are two different ways of doing representation? Um, not quite. So I would say futurization for me is just uh, going from the string to a vector. Um, that's what I mean by futurization. You are you are getting a you know the vector that represents your uh, input, and we have learned we have talked about uh, the term representation, which would be very alike um, feature vector, but there is a slight difference that there is a field called representation learning. So when we say representation, we typically mean they are learned alike word to vec or whatever we get out of transformer. If we have this feature, um, uh, features like absence or, or presence, you could call them representation and no one would be mad. But very often we would not call it because those presence or absence numbers were not learned from the data. So to, to maybe uh, repeat it again, feature vectors or featureization, I would say kind of, for me, it's um, all of these things where we go from string to a vector. Um, um, if you want to be extra precise, call representation vectors that represent the input that were learned from the data, such as word to vec or whatever we get out of transformer. And uh, self-attention is component of the transformer that enables us to get representation of the input that have specific property, namely con being contextualized. But self-attention itself is not a way to produce representations. Um, it's just a part of this architecture that gives us, you know, this property that I mentioned. Um, yeah, I don't know whether that makes it clearer. So in the sense where we're doing a transformer, mm -hmm. we are using representation and not featureization. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, you could, so, okay. You can think about representation as a sub subset of featureization and then you could say, okay, through this uh, transformer, I get the featureize my input in this way. And that wouldn't be, uh, you know, by no means weird to say, um, but very often we'll call, just call, oh, I, I learned this representation. So why well, I'm a little bit hesitant here because these are just the pragmatics and, you know, community norms in the in the field. None of these would be extra, extra bad to, okay. yeah, same. Okay, let's let's move on. So uh, we have uh, you know pre-processed text. We featureized it, and now we are doing some modeling. Um, and I will just quickly go through the things we have. Um, you know, types of models we covered. 
all of these models refer to this function of from input to output that I have mentioned, and we need to learn these weights. So, um, all right. And because we started with this uh, example of binary classification, we first focused on binary classifiers. And I said, we need to make an assumption about which kind, which kind of family of models we are trying to learn. So the easiest family of models to learn are just linear models, which in 2D space are lines, right? Um, and to kind of write what the linear model is for binary classification, you need a feature vector and you need a weight vector. Weight vector is, you know, it's a, it's a fancy way to say these are vector where our parameters are stored. But remember, you know, it's you, you already learned this in high school. When you have a line A, X plus B, A and B here, you put it in a vector, it becomes your weight vector. So it's nothing super fancy. You're just having a polynomial and corresponding coefficients are put into the uh, weight vector. And then you are going to do a dot product between feature and weight vector because we are doing a linear uh, linear model. And we said if the dot product is larger than zero, we are going to predict the positive class. We had this notion of, okay, weight vector is in vector in the space, same space where our features are. So when we make a dot product between these two feature vector and weight vector, if the dot product is positive, it is going to put the kind of steer in this direction. And this is where all of our positive classes should be. And um, if the dot product is negative, then this uh, it's steering us in the other direction, which is desirable. And kind of to do that, to find the weight vectors that achieve that, whenever something is uh, positive, it kind of shows us you should go in this direction and do uh, doing uh, otherwise uh, uh, if the if the uh, example is negative then pointing us to the other direction um, then all we need to do is find ve vectors where these kinds of dot products are achieved and that's what we did with the perceptron which was the, our first algorithm for uh, for you know learning one of these functions uh, where we would change the weights in a way that if we had made a mistake we would um, make the updates of weights such that for that given example that we'd mishandled in this given moment, we would make the um, dot product more positive if the example should have been predicted to be positive and we made the weight vectors such uh, uh, that the dot product is more negative, like smaller if the prediction had to be negative. And that's all we did with the perceptron. And then we move to the logistic regression where we now started to introduce this a little bit more probabilistic notion where we are trying to predict the probability of an example being positive or negative. And for that, we use a logistic function uh, where whenever we have a very high value, as we have seen before here, if Z is high, then the probability will be high. And we, our Z are again dot products between weights and feature vectors. If those dot products are high, we want to predict that uh, that the probability of being a positive class uh, is a very high. So that was the idea between the logistic regression. And with logistic regression, we also introduced this idea of uh, minimizing negative log likelihood, which is not just specific to logistic regression. This idea starting with, OK, the likelihood of our uh, data, uh, the, the conditional probabilities of outputs given inputs, uh, is just a product of those uh, conditional probabilities. And we don't like to uh, maximize these products product, uh, directly. We would rather like to maximize uh, the sum of log probabilities just due to the computational reasons. Um, however, we also like to minimize things more than maximize them because we will gonna use stochastic gradient descent and so on. So. We are going to uh, minimize negative log likelihood, which is the exact same thing as maximizing log, uh, uh, log uh, probabilities. And um, we are doing that and we say, okay, when we are going to define the loss as negative log probability. So this is just the same way of writing uh, whatever is here by introducing a loss function. And now you have training objective. And then we use our stochastic gradient descent, which is the algorithm 
an iterative algorithm to minimize to find the values that minimize a given function. That works really well when the function is convex. So you know that if you make these small steps uh, to the bottom, you'll come to the bottom and then you won't move anymore. Reality is that we don't have those nice situation. And I think all of you have run into training issues during your homework assignments, which are extremely frustrating, right? If we have this, that would never happen. You would never send me a single Piazza post. Probably we'll just come to the bottom of this valley and everything would work nice. But it's a uh, choice of hyperparameters we choose is really important because we end up at different places when the uh, loss function is not convex with respect to the weights. Okay, uh, but stochastic gradient descent, what it, it is exactly is basically you take the gradient of the uh, loss function and then you move into with respect to the uh, the steepest descent, which is determined by the gradient. So here we have, if you if I put a tangent here, like a line, uh, that that's uh, that basically gives us the gradient. And then when we take the uh, you know negative gradient, then we move in the direction of deepest descent rather than uh, you know uh, ascend. And that's all we do, right? With the gradient descent, we change our weights iteratively such that we move to the bottom of this valley, hoping that we are in the good space, um, um, given that the situation might be trickier than we want. And going back to logistic regression, then we to because the you know point of the um, stochastic gradient descent is to move in according to how gradients decide, then we need to calculate the gradients. And the logistic regression we did that you know by hand. We could actually derive the formulas of what the gradients and derivative or derivatives should be. Um, however, later on when we move to neural networks, we are like there is so many derivatives here and we don't want to do this by hand anymore. And then we have given up from doing that by hand and just use the autograd options in a torch, which do these computations, these chain rules uh, for us. And we don't actually compute this by hand. Um, we have extended the logistic regression to multi-class logistic regression. This equation here, it is the same thing we have uh, had here, over here, except that now we have potentially more than two classes. And uh, basically, again, we have this um, dot product exponentiated, but at the, as a normalization, we have the sum of all uh, ex, uh, 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 other options. And what this function does later on, the way we were starting to think about it, it is that it um, squashes the values, the probability it squash, squashes the value from uh, zero uh, to one, um, which is nice because that gives us some notion of probability the same way that the logistic regression, logistic function has uh, given us in the case of just two possibilities. Um, so we call this, this equation over here later on softmax function where if we give uh, the input to our softmax, softmax function uh, vector z of uh, k values is going to spit out again a vector of uh, size k and each one of the values of that softmax vector is going to be a value between zero and one. Where did this become important? This became important when we moved to deep neural networks. Remember, with deep neural networks, we were just doing this sequence of nonlinear transformation of the input. The reason why we did that is because the space where we have our features becomes, you know, it morphs like this one here. And something that was previously not linearly separable now becomes. And that's great, right? That's what we want. And the first neural network we have uh, seen is just a simple feed forward neural network where you have some uh, input features, for example, maybe the average embedding of your input words that you then linearly transform. When we say linear transformation, you know, head immediately, uh -huh, multiplication with, uh, with the matrix. That's how we do linear transformation. Uh, but that's not enough. We need those non-linearities. So we apply non-linear function to each one of the uh, values of the linearly transformed uh, vector. 
Uh, we have different choices in your homeworks you use 10 age or relu, uh, very simple functions. And then uh, in the end, when you have this nonlinear representation of your input, or maybe you have, you know, you did few, few, few layers of uh, nonlinear transformation, the final thing you're doing is the output layer. And for us, output layer now means I'm doing the linear transformation into the number of classes I have. That's going to give me unnormalized logits. I will have for each class one unnormalized logit. So if we had only two classes here, we have vector of size two. I want to squash those values between zero and one. So I'm going to use softmax, which is going to do exactly that for me and giving me the same dimensional vector, which is of uh, you know size two. And now we may need to make a decision of which is the predicted class. So we do the argmax operation. Um, and this is what you implemented in your second homework, where your inputs were the, for each word you have, you did word, uh, word uh, tokenization. And then uh, for each word you have an embedding, and then you average the embedding to get a representation of the entire input sequence. And then we came to more modern age uh, where, uh, you know, uh, we talked about, okay, uh, I mean, now in this overview, we already touched on how with this word to vec averaging, uh, we didn't have, um, we didn't cover that the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that the words might have different senses depending on which context they occur in. We have talked about how stochastic gradient descent becomes annoying if the uh, if it's not a convex, if the loss is not convex function of the weights. Um, and uh, here we also didn't consider the, you know, the word order that became totally relevant once we average these embeddings. So there is no notion of word order. So if we have a very long sequence, that might not be great, especially if the tokens in the beginning depend on the tokens um, at the end, such as, uh, you know, I gave you an example in German language, that's very often that the word verb, the main verb comes at the end of the sentence. And whatever happened from 2017 then covered these situations for us to some extent. But these, um, you know, improvements, these advances uh, stemmed from tasks which were super traditional tasks in NLP. First of all, be, the first task we talked about is just uh, language modeling or engram uh, language modeling. The idea of uh, modeling the probability of the entire input sequence, uh, which we had um, approximated by using the Markov assumption of certain orders. So if we use first order uh, Markov assumption, then we have broken these Pro conditional probabilities here to just depend on the previous word rather than uh, the whole history. And we would talk about the very traditional way, very you know, statistical way of uh, estimating these prob conditional probabilities that we then multiply to get the probability, uh, the joint probability of the entire sequence. And we did that by just doing these relative uh, frequencies by just counting how many times this um, engrams appear relative to something else. And then we were very unhappy at some point because we realized, okay, we're going to have a lot of zeros and we introduce smoothing and, you know, the basic version of smoothing don't work. And I didn't talk much about complicated versions of smoothing, but everything becomes a little bit too tricky and new ideas pops in our mind because we have just learned about feed forward neural networks and that, okay, can we use neural network to predict uh, the next word given the uh, history and use these probabilities that come in the softmax vectors uh, as those conditional probabilities. Um, and we did that um, with, we, we temporarily have introduced recurrent neural networks just to have uh, an idea of how we can model the history, but we didn't really care that much about ne recurrent neural networks because I kept telling you, we are gonna learn about transformers and they're gonna be more useful for us. But what's important, what was important uh, to for us to remember from recurrent neural networks is that we have some notion of capturing history and with recurrent neural networks that was captured by basically combining the representation of the previous hidden state with the current hidden state at the whatever uh, you know position in a sentence we are. And because the previous hidden state depended on a you know previous to its previous hidden state, you're kind of should in theory model the entire history 
although we have learned with that with RNNs, despite the theory that doesn't really happen. That was the first thing. And the second thing is that we are basically doing the same thing as before, like measuring the softmax over the output space, but our output space is now the entire vocabulary. So we have a distribution over the vocabulary and we can sample from that distribution. We can take the highest probable word to be next word. That's just one way to do it. We called it greedy decoding, but remember we had a uh, beam search, nucleus sample, top case sampling, all of those uh, other ways of actually predicting, displaying the next token. So definitely go back to those and see what kind of other situations we covered. Um, we also talked about teacher forcing. I felt like in the previous homework, this didn't really land. Um, you know, um, when you train neural networks and you're predicting the next word, um, you can predict one word at a time and then, you know, dynamically make your input larger as more words you predict, right? We don't like that because it requires us actually doing something and it's so, it's very, recur you know, it's really, uh, the next operation depends on the previous one. We would rather make just a single pass over our model and we can do that if we give uh, whatever actual words had appeared next in our input. And uh, we make the, uh, the the pass over the uh, through the transformer, and we will get the probabilities for each single token. The only issue has been that in this way we are looking into what has appeared next when that's cheating, right? And this is why we have introduced causal masking, where basically in self attention metrics we have introduced some values such that when we do that mixing of representations those that came in the future were zeroed out. And then when we do like combining of them, they become totally unimportant for a given token uh, if they are future tokens to that token. So if that didn't really use, no, if it's still unclear, I, I really recommend going back over teacher forcing and causal masking and how that can co be computationally, um, you know, efficient. I, just to repeat, alternative is that we build the input token by token, and that would take much longer time than just making a single forward pass. All right, we covered language modeling, then we came to sequence to sequence models. This is super important approach, right? Like everything is a sequence to sequence model these days, no matter what you are doing, even if you're doing 3D modeling, you're trying to bend it into this sequence to sequence uh, paradigm because it has been shown that it's so successful for scaling. Um, you put, you linearize your inputs, you linearize your outputs, you just train on a bunch of data you have and that uh, works. First example of sequence to sequence model we have seen was neural machine translation. And uh, the issue with the neural machine translation we have seen is that we require that um, all the given information, so everything we are conditioning prediction on, is crammed into a single vector. And that has empirically shown to, as we have seen, um, to be a bottleneck. So alternative to, uh, to that was to introduce this idea of attention, where given a decoder in a given decoder step, we decide how much each one of the encoder tokens were important. We learn this distribution over them, and then we learn a new representation, which is a mix of encoder representations, uh, depending on how much they are important to a given decoder step. And then instead of making just the prediction from the decoder hidden state, we make the prediction based on both of these new contextualized representation of the encoder for a given decoding step and the given uh, decode the hidden representation. Uh, one another thing that I felt wasn't really clear maybe uh, when we, you were implementing the last homework is that when you are doing the uh, decoding, so you are predicting next word, at each one of these tokens that you are decoding, you have loss, right? In the end, uh, you are doing the instance level backpropagation. So you average these losses and only then you do the backward pass, right? We are not doing the backward pass after each one of these. So uh, just have that uh, in mind. Okay, and 
attention brought us to also transformer and self attention transformer introduced many many new things for us but this idea of attention was really you know uh, really really brought to the core of this architecture where now we want our encoder to also attend to other tokens in the um, you know source Whereas with previously, we just went from decoder step to the encoder, right? Only we, we cared only about how much encoder source tokens are important for a given decoding token. And that has changed with the transformer where we also change representation of encoder uh, hidden states depending on how much tokens are important to each other. I won't cover the transformer again because we have implemented it and we talked about it in two lectures and uh, it always takes uh, too much time. Uh, so definitely go over it one more time if you feel like uh, it's still uh, unclear. And this just a few more minutes, uh, I want to talk about what we talked about after transformer. So the transformers, you still, you know, didn't really brought any solutions to this problem that the loss function is uh, not convex with respect to the weight vectors. And we said, well, it's really important where we end up in this uh, space. We want to end up in a nice space where um, these weights can already be close to the right solution for many tasks. And that brought us to idea of pre-training where we take our randomly initialized transformer and then we pre-train it with self-supervised objectives meaning objectives that still work like supervised machine learning. We still have softmax. We still do, you know, negative log likelihood cross entropy, which are, we learned the same things, but we are not gonna label any of this data. So we assume something is ground truth, namely either masked or the next token, but we don't label the data. So in this sense, these are self-supervised objective. And we do that for a long time. And then we end up with these weights end up in a nice uh, nice space. And then we do fine tuning stage, which is basically just training of the model, but starting from these pre-trained weights. Yes. So pre-trained is, uh, this is very similar to the speed model again. Mm -hmm. So we do not have access to any sort of kind of Yeah, so Virtuvec is also a neural network that has been uh, pre-train and then you take the representation and then you combine it with the, you add new layers to it. And in that sense, pre-training is, is similar. Uh, however, um, there is one difference. Um, I mean, there are many differences, but uh, uh, let me highlight a few things. So uh, very similarly, when we do mask language modeling, which is a self-supervised objective for pre-training where we mask some tokens and then we try to uh, predict what were the tokens in the mask positions. And uh, with this approach, we have transformer and then we pre-train it in this fashion. And then we just ditch the last output layer, uh, which was of the size hidden dimension times number of tokens in the vocabulary. And we replace it with new parameters for the output metrics. Namely, we want to add, uh, we care about, let's say binary classification, we are going to introduce uh, new metrics, new output metrics, randomly initialized one that we need to now uh, fine tune to find appropriate values for the task, right? And But the difference here is that we are fine tuning the entire model. So new, new, new metrics that we have just introduced, but we also back propagate through all of the transformer layers we have used for the mask language modeling. So we do that with Virtuvec, we ditch the whole thing. We just left, you know, we just taken the Virtuvec uh, representations. So um, th that's a major difference that the uh, model here, we still, you know, use most of it. Especially when, with, when, when, when the pre-training objective is language modeling and when we don't ditch that output layer, but rather we frame everything as a text generation task then we literally are using the 100% of our model from pre-training. And if you are doing fine tuning of that model, we change all of the parameters. Um, so yeah, you, keeping the model is a, is a definitely new thing we have uh, used, but it, you were right to make the parallel that virtual pre-training is also pre-training in some sense. Okay. Um, yeah, I just mentioned that we have also learned 
language modeling uh, was one of our pre-training objectives. And then we have not uh, removed the output layer and we that enable us to do all sorts of prompting, right? We talked about zero shot prompting, in context learning, chain of thought prompting, and then the idea of actually fine tuning model for a long time, another pre-training stage to you know, do exactly these kinds of prompting situations. And, and we also talked about RLHF and some open problems that are left with RLHF and how this is a new you know, uh, line of open-ended research people are doing. I don't have time to cover it, but I want to uh, just highlight that we have talked about many different ways of evaluating models. In your homework, you very much so focused on accuracy and F1 scores. And this notion of what is generalization and overfitting was important. But I also want to remind you that not everything can be evaluated with accuracy and F1 scores. We talked about evaluating language models with perplexity, like how good of a language models they are. We evaluate with uh, perplexity. And for machine translation, we talk about blue scores and this idea that automatic evaluation such as blue score can be poorly correlated with human judgments of the quality of a machine translation, which actually is the case for many text generation tasks that the automatic measurements are not, as, not correlated with how people judge whether the quality is good or not. So don't forget, accuracy is not the only evaluation measurement. We very much so have many different ways depending on what the application is. Okay, so let's uh, finish here. Uh, sorry for going over. And uh, yeah, good luck with the preparation. See you all on Wednesday. Don't forget to bring your IDs. I didn't mention you can have one, uh, one sheet uh, of the notes, uh, any way you like to make them. How I don't care how little the font is, nothing, uh, do whatever you want. <laughs>